for tuning in to another episode of Speak Out. I'm your host, J. Jewel L. And I'm Dino L. <laughs> Listen, Dean, today we have an amazing guest, okay? Well, Absolutely. You, you know how I like to do. I like to start off with the quotes. So this quote is fitting for our next guest. It says, um, it's a quote by Miles Davis, and he says, I'll play it first hmm. and tell you what it is later. So that's how I would describe our next guest, Mr. Gentle George Folks. Mr. Folks, who is an entrepreneur, an educator, a filmmaker, and uh, what folks don't know, he is a pioneer yes. in Atlanta filmmaking. And so we're going to talk to Gentle George Folks today and get some real history lessons, y'all. Not even in the books, things that y'all don't even know about. This is the real deal. Okay, about Atlanta um, and the filmmaking industry. So, without further ado, Mr. Gentle George, folks, welcome to Speak Out. I thank you, thank you, thank you. Nice introduction. Well, thank you. Listen, as we get started, everyone is buzzing about the fact that Atlanta is now the hub, the mecca for filmmaking and so many people that are making films here that have studios here but what they don't know is that you about to uh spit some knowledge enlightenment yes enlightenment on just how Atlanta really came into play in terms of filmmaking um <clears throat> and we're going to start with your early days and Morehouse. Yeah, what you sparked him? What yeah. sparked you to become a filmmaker, first of all? Well, I had always enjoyed the Academy Awards. And I thought every year, looking at the best work in cinema and watching it be awarded mm. was, was stellar. And so the first film I ever saw on the big screen in the Bronx um, was Lawrence of Arabia hmm. and uh, didn't understand the film, but understood the cinematography and the, the way it was delivered on screen. And that, that stayed with me. The other thing is I loved um, the power of the Ed Sullivan show. We have a really big show. <laughs> and the ability to bring world-class artists on who performed live. Absolutely. And that to me was stunning. Mm. And then the last thing was going to a film and watching the emotions of a film touch you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I fell in love with that, but I fell more in love with the idea of organizing people and making it happen mm. artistically. I had two singing groups in the Bronx when I was growing up. The first one was my boys in the neighborhood where we imitated the Four Tops and the, um, the Temptations with Dickies, black, <laughs> with white shirts. Uh -huh. So that was, and then we would change the Dickies, but we always kept the white shirt. Uh -huh. So that kept us uniformed. Mm -hmm. And then we practiced the routines, the steps, the whole nine. I choreographed the whole nine. Wow. And we would do talent shows, and, and, and that gave us the opportunity to develop that ability. So I was already thinking, how could I figure out my niche in entertainment? And um, I just figured out that if, if I could put all these forces together, I could find my niche. What brought you to Atlanta, to Morehouse? Well, I went to high school in Cambridge. I lived in Cambridge and went to high school at a place called Palfrey Street in Watertown. I was on the Cambridge AD. is Boston, right? Yeah. Okay. I was I was on a prep school scholarship ah. at a place called Palfrey Street School. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the connection between Palfrey Street and Chicago is very real. Hmm. There's a company called Rise and Steel out of Chicago. And the man who founded Rise and Steel was one of the biggest steel companies in America. Rise and Steel's grandson is Ned Ryerson, who opened up his own prep school. Hmm. 
and he was a Harvard graduate. And his school was an open system. So if you wanted to go take a class at a different high school, or you wanted to go take a class at a college, you could do that and get credit for it. Wow. So there's a famous jazz singer today named Nina Freelon. Mm -hmm. And her mother was famous in the Boston area, but her daughter's world famous. They invited me to come to go to the school, but I didn't have no place to live, so I had to live with them my junior year. And Nina Freelon has gone on to become a great jazz singer, and we played me jazz together. My senior year, I had to find a place to live. So my Harvard people said, you could come stay with us. Mm -hmm. So I wound up living at Harvard at the Afro Center as a high school kid. Wow. wow. And everyone in the mansion on Sacramento Street, 75 Sacramento Street, was a senior in college. I was a senior in high school. So you got advanced placement credits while you were in high school in an open campus yeah. environment. Yeah. That may have been a yeah. first. Yeah. And... And I had been to every college campus in Boston Wow! before I graduated. I would go to a campus every other day to study the library and the campus layout. Wow! I examined college campuses. Mm. So I was a master of college campuses. So, George, tell me, what were some of your experiences at Morehouse yeah, how regarding and, and filming? How and, and let me just finish. Were there other individuals who you inspired or inspired you while you were there? Yeah, well, once I once I was in Boston, I was trying to decide if, you know, staying in Boston was going to work, mm -hmm. which it didn't. I didn't see the vision because it was winters that I couldn't really engage anymore. You know, <laughs> plus I'd had two incredible run ins with the police where they made it clear that I was a nigger. Mm. Wow. And so I made it clear to myself, I'm not really trying to run into this no more. I had three incidents with the police. But two was where I was called a nigger. And the third one is where they pulled guns on us. Oh, wow. So I was like, you know, my luck might run out. So mm -hmm. I might want to get up out of this town. Plus, I had been everywhere in the city. So it was like, what else am I going to do here? I'm going to spend four more years here. So I'm coming up the back steps of the mansion, which is like what they call the pantry mm -hmm. in mansions. I'm coming up the back steps. And Clement Cans from, um, from St. Louis filmmaker at Harvard, hands me a book and says, young and you might want to read this. So I looked down at the title and the title is um, this, The Life of Paul Robeson or something. Mm -hmm. So I read the book and I discover a man by the name of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, mm -hmm. a giant. <laughs> I'm blown away. Mm -hmm. And then I realize he's running a school of all black men. Mm. And then I realized he's running the school that Dr. King went to. Yes. I saw oh, application going in now. <laughs> so I dropped the application and uh, got the letter back, got on the bus to New York City, got on the subway, went up to the Bronx, used my house key, went in my mother's house. She was in the kitchen, handed her the letter. She took the letter, went in the room, opened up the letter, came back in the kitchen and she was crying. Mm. Prior to me applying, my mother said they only take the best. Mm. And I never said anything. But I knew I needed to bring that letter to her. So when she came in the kitchen, she said, oh, my God, my son is going to Morehouse. I said, I'm not just going. I'm going to make history. All right, now. All right. All I was right. about probably 17, 18, somewhere in there. So how was filming there? Did you meet anyone that you inspired or inspired you? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing about what happened at Clark was that Dr. Vivian Henderson created the Mass Comm program. Mm. And so he created CLK. Mm -hmm. And he created the degree in mass communications, which allowed you to get a degree in broadcasting on journalism. Oh, okay. So that, that's, the, that's the real big picture that everybody's missing. Okay. The president of Clark created a department for mass communications. Mm. And so... Um, this issue of what Clark stands for is very important to understand from the presidential level. And Dr. Vivian Henderson was an economist. Mm -hmm. So he understood that this is a new field where we can create a whole new set of jobs and careers. Absolutely. So you took advantage of the opportunities that you saw all this coming together as a young man. Mm. 17. 17 years old, coming to Atlanta, from Boston, by way of New York, okay? And 
what did you think that you, what was your vision? I know you had a vision because you, you were a deep dude. What was your vision when you graduated, what you were going to do with this, with this mass communication degree? Well, I was going to try to stay behind the scenes because my goal was to always be Michael Colleone. Okay. I have been I have been thoroughly affected by Michael Colleone from the day I saw it on screen. Cause that, five. Yeah, because that was really me in life and my with my friends. I really always was the force behind whatever was going on. Mm-hmm. So I have walked and lived that life of I'm I'm Michael Colleone, you know, without the criminality and the right. But I'm Michael Colleone. The I'm, right. uh, yeah, I'm 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 going to strategize it for you. And I realized that at the time in the 70s, people were really frustrated with Hollywood. So I said to my friends at 17, I could put somebody in Hollywood. And my Mm. boy said, what? I said, I could put somebody in Hollywood. Not me, but I could put somebody in Hollywood. And I just didn't know who it would be, but I knew I could do it. And then um, I got to thinking while we were beginning to play around at Clark that I needed a platform to let folks know that I was the force. So I created an organization called the Tri-State Area, where I pulled together all the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut folks from the whole AU Center and created a directory and got the organization chartered. And the one person that's in that group who is legendary is Jim Brown's daughter, Karen Brown. She died. But Karen Brown was in the original group of the tri-state area organization. And she's in the original picture when we charted, when we became a chartered organization. But that move that I made as a sophomore put me on Front Street. Now, I got to Atlanta on a Sunday. On right, Monday, I was emptying garbage cans at CLK. And the guy said, what you doing? I said, I'm looking for a job. He hmm. said, well, why are you emptying the garbage can? I said, it looks like I'm working then maybe someone might give me a job. He started laughing. And he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from New York. He said, well, what do you want to do in communications? So I'm, I'm going to be a filmmaker. He said, well, why are you over here in the radio station? So I'm trying to get it all. You know, and so the reputation I had was I was a shaker and mover. I got to know all kinds of people. But I developed a formula that most people will never see in college. I operated with presidents. Mm -hmm. I got to know the presidents of the college. And my theory with knowing presidents was, what good are you promoting the school if you can't promote the ones who are rocking and rolling, getting the degrees? Your best sales pitch is you selling us, the Mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. So if we off the chain, then your sales pitch to getting money and talking about investing in the school is easier. So you need to know me. I'm George folks. All right now. That's how I wrote. All right, I know you I know you said gentle George folks, but I think the you know and George the force folks they need to be thrown in there too cuz you was a force to be reckoned with. So you said you can put somebody in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And you put somebody in Hollywood. Yes, I did. Yeah. Tell us that story and tell us who he, who he is. Well, <clears throat> when when my sophomore year a guy by the name of Otha Robinson goes by Ad- uh, uh, Adisa now. But Adisa had a, uh, a new roommate that was a freshman. And he said, my roommate is interested in media. Would you be interested in taking him under your wing? I said, yeah, yeah, I could do that. So he introduced me to the gentleman. The guy's name is Spike Lee. He's from New York. He's a freshman. The Spike Lee? The Spike Lee. Okay. And he says, you know, the guy is a freshman. And immediately I knew he was from New York. We start talking. And he had a good humor. Mm-hmm. And I started laughing. I said, okay, I like your humor. I like your humor. But I knew he wasn't in my league. When I say in my league, I ran with the kind of men who they could play ball, they could make money, they could party, and they were outstanding when it came to the honeys. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I call the double O club. You know what I'm saying? Like the James Bond type club. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he wasn't in that league. But I needed to create this artistic group that was going to embody what I wanted to do. And so I befriended him, took him over to MassCom, made sure he got involved in MassCom. And the thing that got Spike involved was that we had a black film fest. We had a film festival. Okay. And... The professor, Candy Casper, and I had already been working together in filmmaking. She was teaching me editing. So Candy already liked me. 
So we created an organization called OMAX. This was inside MassCom. And Al Goggins was the president. I was the vice president. And I said, let me take the film festival from Candy Casper and make it happen. She had the money from the city to do Charlie Chaplin. I told Spike he hit the roof. Hmm. He was like, why are we going to do a Charlie Chaplin film festival when we could do a black film festival when we had a black school? I said, I like it. As the Don, mm -hmm. are you willing to take it on and make it happen? He said, yeah. So Spike got all the films, organized it, did a masterful job. I gave him A plus, and I wanted his name on the program. And the committee stood me down, asked me to stand down and not put his name on the program. So that original program that's in my book mm -hmm. doesn't have his name on it. But he absolutely mastered that program. And that was his first opportunity to be seen in MassCom. That's how he got introduced to being in MassCom. Eventually, he had his own radio shift on CLK, which gave him his own exposure. And then I pulled him into um, some of the other film stuff that we were doing, but it was the coronations that I was involved with at Morehouse that gave him the platform to understand how to be a part of directing. Because I'm, I'm convinced that if you can direct black folks, you can direct anything. Speaking of platforms, George, how has the filming industry given you a platform to confront some of the social and political issues we're facing today? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the film pioneers when it comes to what happened in Georgia. Um, I worked for the Georgia Council for the Arts back in 1978 and had over, I think, six assignments that, that lasted six months where I had to move to the community and live in the community. And so I tell a different kind of story. You know, I don't tell a story that has to do with 30, 40 years later and what's going on currently. I'm part of when they weren't letting you in the door. Mm -hmm. They weren't getting you involved. And this is a federal program? This was a state, state. program funded by the federal, federal government, government. Ah, funded okay. by President Jimmy Carter. I got you now. And so the Artists in Resident program had state money, but they weren't spending that particularly on black artists. Yes. But the federal program that Jimmy Carter had, had introduced allowed me to become employed to go and work in the town and live there for six months. Mm. I actually got to do that. And as a result of that, I was in the small communities teaching filmmaking. I bet that right was out of school. That was an experience. Oh, it was, it was it was it was it was absolutely phenomenal to be a young black man coming in, teaching the kids the art of filmmaking mm. and creating a product which then was going to be premiered on the campus for everyone to see at the school. Wow. That, that's right. That's this is back then. Not, yeah. And 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 you had good students, but they also threw in their bad students to get them out of their mm -hmm. other environments. You know, as a principal, mm -hmm. you've seen people do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would take those students and turn them into stars. And, and speaking of turning people into stars, mm -hmm. and I just want to go back to the fact that you actually served as a mentor for Spike Lee. Yeah, all the way through from undergraduate, all the way through graduate school, all the way to um, getting him the opportunity to get a distribution deal. I made a deal with Spike that I would get him a distribution deal when he got out of uh, film school. But um, there's a famous chart that shows the whole process of how I developed Spike. Mm -hmm. And I created that chart because I'm, I'm in the business of not letting people distort history. And people have a nice way of distorting history when they don't mm -hmm. understand it. That's because it's his story. Thank you. Thank you. And so I think the story that is very beautiful in the AU Center is that these brothers worked together and did this, this, this opportunity to pull each other up. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty. And that's something I will never allow anybody to distort because mm -hmm. then you undermine the beauty of the HBCU experience, mm. which I can't let you do yes. because right. we didn't have no money, but we massively figured out how to put one of us in, in, in Hollywood. And so the, the distribution deal is what really helped him when he finished film school 
because we had two important things we had to do. One is that you had to finish film school with a 60 minute color film. Wow. That was my request in 1979, which he did by 83. But in the meantime, there's a famous gentleman by the name of Barry Alexander Brown. Barry Alexander Brown is a friend of mine who I befriended and convinced him to engage in the black community in 1980. And then Barry stayed in touch with me. I wanted Barry to give Spike a job while he was in film school. Barry did that. He then agreed to distribute Spike's thesis film, Joe Bedstein's Barbershop, we, we Cut Heads, which is the blessing that I wanted because I wanted Spike to get a distribution deal mm -hmm. on the 60 Minute Color film. Mm -hmm. So within 1983, to 1986 is probably one of the shortest terms for somebody to go from being unknown to being a world-class filmmaker. And I designed the formula that put him right at the door of Hollywood. Wow. So when you look at how, the, how Spike's career has grown, how the film industry has grown in Atlanta, really, what, what's, what's your take on it? Well, you know, anything moves. You know, you look at the NBA back in the 70s and the 60s, you know, it was a, it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and most people don't know that the Globetrotters are responsible for the integration of the NBA based on a meeting in Chicago two years in a row with George Mikan and the Minneapolis Lakers. And they lost both games. Yes. And then in 1949, they integrated the NBA. And now look at the NBA today. But the Globetrotters are responsible. Absolutely. And they didn't want to put them in the Hall of Fame. And Dr. J said they have to go in the Hall of Fame. They're the ambassadors of basketball. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you don't know the connection between a George Folks and what has now transpired in Atlanta. But if you go back and just take the history and leave it in the context that it was created, mm. you'll understand how life just goes on decades and then things just explode. You follow me? Yes. So you can't, you can't in 2019 clearly draw a line to trying to figure out the connection to George folks and what we were doing in the AU Center. And, and, in, and in 2020. Can't. You can't. But I do know this much. It was, it was the ability to produce a director that produced an employer. Yes. I didn't produce an actor who had to go look for a job. Mm -hmm. I developed a director that could then hire other people. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, Sam L. Jackson doesn't hire Spike. Spike hires Sam L. Jackson. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. What do you see as a major obstacle for minorities in America today? Um, the inability, the, the, the inability to not explain the elements of overt and covert racism. When you can't understand the obstacle that's in front of you and figure out what that obstacle is, then you can't outsmart the obstacle. You have to out now you have to outsmart a king cobra if you want to get past the cobra. But if you can't if you haven't studied the cobra, then you can't outsmart it. Mm. And I don't think that we've out we've done righteous work in understanding the institution of discrimination and how you oppress somebody and keep somebody down. I don't think we've done our work. And I'm, I'm talking specifically in filmmaking. Uh, I, I think in filmmaking, we've made progress because it's all about box office. Mm -hmm. But I think Spike and other filmmakers have inspired people to take an interest in this field as opposed to taking their talent in another field. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of talented people that could have gone in other fields, but chose to be in our field. And that just has created this enormous buzz of collaboration of brilliant people. Mm. And I guess Black Panther is a wonderful example of the box office statement. But then you look at people like uh, Shonda Rhimes on television. Mm -hmm. You look at Viola Davis. You look at all the other talented people around. We have a lot of talented people in our industry that could have been in other people's industries in entertainment. But we got them. I was going to say Wakanda. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got forever. him. We got him. We got him. And, and, and so as we see how the film industry has progressed in the Atlanta area, um, like I said in your intro, you have been an educator, a mentor, 
a comedian, filmmaker, filmmaker, mm-hmm. author. I, I, I mean, even with your vision, are you surprised at the success, the amount of success that Atlanta is now experiencing this billion dollar industry that's bringing into the state? Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not only impressed with it, I think it's done very well. I think it will con- probably continue to do well. What I'm always concerned about is do you have your own vision of how to preserve the legacy? And are you part of someone else's plan or do you have a plan? Mm. And mm-hmm. collaboration plans is where we have always failed. We have to be masters of collaboration which means you trust other people and you get along with other people Mm -hmm. and you are able to get along because you're part of understanding her strength, his strength is valuable. Can we work together and create that? Unless you do that, then you're just an individual doing outstanding work. Mm -hmm. But when you collaborate, then you make statements that are really important because that's the higher level of intellectual thinking when you can collaborate. Absolutely. Well, well, how do you address... Um, someone that may be listening saying, listen, Gentle George, I hear you. I'm an artist and I collaborated with folks, but I've lost money. Um, I Folks have stolen my idea. How do you find that right type of collaboration? Well, you have to create institutions that people are going to be committed to preserving the integrity of what you do. Mm-hmm. The, the Grammys is a non, most people don't know this, the Grammys is a nonprofit organization. All they do is promote music and the love of music. Their television show is a commercial show on CBS. Mm -hmm. Okay. But their whole, their whole existence is to promote music. And one of the top people in the financial world, the Grammys was one of my protégés. So I know a lot about the Grammys and, and I was a member of the Grammys because of her. But I think you don't have institutions that celebrate the concept of what you want to preserve. And that's how you play the game at the global level. The UN is designed to keep nations discussing things that could cause war. So you got a place where these 195 countries can come together and say, let's talk it out before we get ugly. Mm -hmm. We're not, the brilliant minds in our community are not creating institutional roles that have to do with what is your purpose. Mm. You're the facilitator of why people can get along because you make sure that this person has money, this person has a good idea, this person wants to direct, so you bring collaboration. You're the collaborator, and you bring that together, and we're not doing that. George, how will you continue to tell our journey in America through film? It's good. That's a good, um, I think it's a strong question. I think you have to begin to solicit particularly stories that come out of family reunions. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. You have to get family reunions to do two things. One, convince family reunions to do family stories where everybody gets dressed up, you know, look nice, and then premiere the family movie. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. So this way you have a greater personal, closer love for filmmaking because you had your own movie, you got your mm-hmm. own family movie and it's up on YouTube and the whole family. Mm-hmm. When you didn't come to the family reunion, you can at least say, I saw the movie and I saw my mom and my daddy mm-hmm. in the movie and the movie was done well. Mm-hmm. Of course, I want you to keep the movie under 60 minutes, okay, mm-hmm. black folks? Keep the movie under 60 minutes. Do not make no 92 hour movie. Don't need it, okay? Just make it 60 or less. Don't, don't make a root, root another saga. root saga, yeah. right? No, we don't a need that. Long, no, no, we don't know? need that, we don't need that. Yeah. You know, I always tell people in music, remember, Aretha Franklin rocked the world with a two minute and 36 second song called Respect. Respect. Right. It was under three minutes. So understand if you can do something comprehensive and do it well, you're going to always have a greater impact. The second part of that is who are the people in your family's legacy that has an unknown story that is phenomenal? Absolutely. That's true. My grandmother used to say, everybody has a story, Mm -hmm. you know, so Mm -hmm. you got to, you you got to find those gotta unknown find stories, stories. Yeah. Yeah. right? Those great unknown stories where somebody did something phenomenal and it never was documented or they just talked about it orally. Find those stories because those are motion pictures. Mm. Those are television series. Yes. Those yes. are stories that preserve. The last thing I want to share with you is this, and this is going to change the game for folks listening if they're really listening. 
Black people in America must create their own antique houses where you decide what is of value. Mm -hmm. So let's say you say, these are my grandmother's shoes that she wore during slavery. They're worth $50,000. You put a value on it mm. as an American. Mm -hmm. Where are the black antique houses where we have stuff in the house that we, that we know is part of our legacy that we put a dollar value on it because we've now redefined capitalism right. to defend what we stand for. Absolutely. That's right. That's black right. antique houses. I like that. I like that, George. <laughs> George folks yeah, never, in the house. Just look. George has plenty, plenty of ideas. This is this is the man who is a pioneer. Yes, absolutely. And you still dropping knowledge. And you still somebody listening is gonna pick up on that. If nobody else picking it up I on am. it, I am. Right. I'm like you, Dean. I'm picking up on it. And look, it'll be saying, you know, I was gonna speak out. And uh yeah. Drop that, uh, drop that knowledge, and we, we move forward on that. <laughs> yes, I helped. I, that was my protege. That yes, was the sir. Jewel L. So George, how you know we we like to talk about arts and activism as well mm -hmm. on Speak Out. So mm -hmm. since you uh, work with Spike Lee, and Spike has been known to make some um, movies that have. Mm -hmm. You can consider, you know, active activism. Of course, um, of course. They really touch on some subject matters. Yeah. So how do you see the art of storytelling and film and connecting that into um, activism? I, I think activism needs to be more on our documentary side. Hmm. Okay. I don't think activism needs to be on our commercial side. I just don't think, I think you go to be entertained, you need to be entertained. I, I, church needs to stay at church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I always say to black folks, nobody should preach unless you're a preacher. Otherwise, find a creative way to tell the story. Mm. But black people have a tendency to think it's okay to preach when you ain't a preacher. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. You don't wear the right title. Mm -hmm. Find a way to be creative. Tell the story in humor. Tell the story in passion, mm -hmm. but do not do what that person is doing in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And I just think commercial filmmaking is commercial filmmaking. It's entertainment. It should stay entertainment. Stop okay. trying to teach folks. Just entertain them. Now, if you want to educate them, then go into documentary Document. filmmaking. Yes. yes. And do the Ken Burns thing <clears throat> and put together brilliant documentaries. Interesting. And this way you're not dealing with, I want to be in State Farm Arena but I only got 50 people coming. You in the wrong venue. <laughs> right. If yeah. you got 40,000 people coming, then you need to be in State Farm or yeah. you need to be in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yeah. Stay in the lane of what is accurate in what you're doing so therefore it plays out correctly. And we often are very inaccurate in our original thinking. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody to challenge you. But, you know, many people have come to me ideas and left and said, he was not very particularly, you know, nice to me on my idea, but he was nice to me as a person because I'm trying to get you to understand how things work when they're done right. They yes. click. George, I have a question for you too about when we're talking about filmmakers. Who are the filmmakers that you enjoy watching? Ken Burns is at the top of my list on the documentary yeah, side. I think he it. just takes on brilliant projects. Yeah. Um, I've always loved Coppola. I mean, Francis Ford Coppola. Mm -hmm. I always thought he was was brilliant. Um, I like George Lucas because I went to USC, so I'm, I'm always going to appreciate George Lucas. I thought John Singleton as a young filmmaker had a brilliant insight. Mm -hmm. And I think Baby Boy is one of the greatest black love stories um, in American history. But going back, you know, I love all the great classic films um, back in the day. Uh, I, I, I fell in love with Claudine. I thought it was one of the best mm -hmm. well-told black stories um, back in the day. But To Kill a Mockingbird is one of my favorite films. Mm -hmm. um, I love Casablanca. Um, Frankly, my dear. Yeah, I, I, you well, know. That's no, that's Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. It's Gone with the Wind. I just like good storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um, I think good storytelling is the secret on commercial filmmaking, that the story is told well and that means you have to have good directing and good writing. Absolutely. Those two are critical. You know, they've proven that any film that makes money, it's because of the director. And it was played again, Sam. 
uh, yeah, I was yeah, looking for played that, against that, him in Casablanca. Yeah. 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 Were, were there any Spike Lee films that you really enjoyed and could say, yeah, Spike, you, you, you did good? Um, I think Do the Right Thing, you know, I like kind of told mm-hmm. the story, mm-hmm. um, had a city flavor to it. And then it had my buddy Bill Nunn in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I would probably stop it. For me personally, I would stop it. You know, do the right thing. I'm surprised uh, Spike never had you in any I films. I mean, I'm just gonna that, throw, Jules. just go on and throw no, that out there. No, no, I don't. I don't think that. You know, I don't think that. Um, based on the history of the development of the relationship, um, you know, you can't take a giraffe and um, you know try to make it a chihuahua. <laughs> you it know, won't fit. it won't fit. You have to let a giraffe be a giraffe. Mm-hmm. So if you bring him to the table, you got to let him be what he is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, George is a leader. And so any way you bring him to the table, according to my mother, you would have to let him play <clears throat> his role as the player that he is. And if you don't do that, then you don't need to bring him to the table. I was always mm-hmm. told, George, that the, the person in charge doesn't have to sit at the head of the table because wherever he sits is the head of the table. And that's what my mother said about me. She was like, no matter where you are in the equation, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll always be his mentor. No matter what happens, he can't change that. And then the legacy of Morehouse, that was your contribution to him. But always remember, you were his blessing. He didn't have to turn out to be your blessing. Wow. Mm, Wow. As we wrap up, um, I'm your host, Jewel L. And I'm your host, Dean L. And we just want to remind you, remember you have a voice. Speak out. (laughs) 